survive without that hybrid. So you have the you have the opportunity. We want you to come and fellowship in person, right? That's Wednesday night from 7 to 8 every Wednesday, one hour in Port Norris and in Violet. But also you can tune in on Wednesday night on the platform. And I, I want to stress during the end of this year, going through you know some of the fact that New Year's was on Sunday and we also had Christmas on Sunday. It made us have to put a few reruns on. But don't worry about that. Two coats of paint are better than one, right? As long as you got the rerun, it helps you out. You can go back and look at those messages anytime you want. But I'm just excited because tonight there is a word uh, starting off for 2024. I don't know about you, but this is a very strange year as, as it has started. And there is plenty for us to be concerned about. Y'all set? I'm doing this while you get set. Don't forget, go online, share, hit somebody up, make sure you subscribe, YouTube, uh, and make sure right now you tell somebody that we're on. Let's start with a word of prayer, then we'll go right into the word of God. You're gonna be, you're gonna be inspired, you're gonna be lifted by what God has to say. It's gonna give you some ways to handle what's going on this year. Let's pray. Bless the eternal God our Father. We get an opportunity, another opportunity, to pray, read, and hear your word. God, there's no power as strong as your word. We rely on it. We live for it. It has, a power, it has effectiveness in all that we go through. And now, God, we made it this far because there was a word that carried us through. So tonight, God, infuse and infill everyone that's listening with power through this word tonight. Make sure that they realize every word they learn, every word they process in their spirit is bringing strength to their lives. And we thank you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to start here. Uh, these are very tenuous times at best, right? Temporary times at best that we're living in. Think about what I'm saying. Um, it means that something can be true today, and because the world is shifting and changing, it's not true any longer. And believe it or not, that's what brings unresolved anxiety and, and into your life, because there's nothing you can really depend on except the Word of God. But I, I'll tell you a conversation I had with a friend of mine. We were talking about how temporary these times are, how things keep changing. And we started laughing because we started talking about the good old days and found ourselves talking about something that was just four to six months ago. The good old days used to be a decade, or you talked about a special time growing up. But now the world is changing so fast that the good old days just happened to be something four or six months ago. What I mean by that, we were talking about, may not seem like an important conversation, but the price of eggs. Have you seen how high the price of eggs are? I read a report that said egg prices jumped 60% in 2022, starting with the pandemic. They jumped to 60%. Matter of fact, he said to me, I went and bought a dozen of eggs for $6. I know eggs could be bought for $0.98, cent, $1.98, but they keep going up. And then there's all kinds of excuses. Uh, the farm group, ones who actually, the farmers who we have to buy the eggs from, are saying this just seems like a, a 
price gouging scheme from the companies. And then the companies are saying that there is an outbreak of bird flu. So anyway, and before that, chicken, a staple of our society, used to be so cheap and now it's going up. But that's coming down to pre-pandemic prices, but not that. Think about it. anything you order, you got to order in advance. Our world is going into shortages. This is prophetic. I'm teaching right now. Don't you think that anything in this world is going to last? It's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse, and it's going to get worse, and you need to get stronger and stronger and stronger. Not weaker. You need more word if you're going to survive. That's why this series of Bible study messages I'm talking about this week is entitled Before You Give Up. Write it down. I want to give you some promises, some principles you can stand on before you, somebody needed this, you're listening to me now, you need to tweet that out to somebody if you do that, or send a message uh, in, in the chat and just say, there's some preaching that's about to go forth to tell you what to do before you give up. And quit jiving people, all of us, you know, when I was growing up, I used to hear all the time, that you're going to go through some circumstances that's going to be so hard, it's going to be such a bearing on your soul, that you're going to feel like giving up. And I used to think when I was younger, not me, when I was younger, but now since I've grown up, I've had a whole lot of those moments, and I'm not the only one that have had those moments in our life where we felt like giving up. I know you front, I know you won't, don't want anyone to know that happened, but there's been some very critical, crucial, hard moments. But I got good news for you. As we look at this text, we're going to find out that this text, which I'm going to go at it from a perspective that the Holy Spirit gave to me, the strength and, and uh, I think the tenacity of this father is going to teach us some things. So go with me to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. I love Mark's gospel. Mark chapter 9. Mark's gospel is the second of the four gospels and, and one of the three uh, synoptic gospels. And Mark's gospel is about deeds and actions and strength and about how God was fighting demonic forces and how Jesus Christ had gone through proving not only that he was the son of God, but he did it through the power of his miracles. Somebody needs a miracle tonight. Listen, miracles are still real. Don't get so caught up in this world that you don't understand you need a miracle. Now, seldom do I do this, but we're starting at chapter 14 of this ninth chapter. Now, because of this chapter starting in chapter 14, let me give you a brief summary of what has happened. Uh, when this chapter opens, you remember they had just come from Caesarea Philippi, and this chapter is opening now. It's one of the heights of Jesus' ministry. And in this ninth chapter, the first verses talk about Jesus says, some of you will not see the kingdom of God when it comes. That some of you are, uh, will still be here when the kingdom of God comes. So understand by who will know, in no way taste death till they see the kingdom of God. That's what he says in verse 1. And he said that some of you will not die till you see the kingdom of God. We're not teaching about that, but Jesus was trying to share with them that since he came, the kingdom of God has come. You ought to understand that as soon as you get saved, you step into the kingdom of God. And when you step into the kingdom of God, you have all of the godly power resources. You got to remember that during that time, they were Gentiles, or they were, they were following the Jewish law and the Jewish religion. But Jesus said, since I'm here, since you've seen what I've done, if you follow the teachings that I give you, you will put command and possess all the power of the power of God. Now, he was only talking about some of them, but he's talking about all of us. I just want to aside and tell somebody, if you understand the word of God that gives us promises, promises like peace, promises like prosperity or fullness, promises like um, we would not have to worry about fear and anxiety, promises like we could pray and something would happen, we can touch and agree, are you listening to me, something would happen, then you have that power, you possess it. Don't sit up there and watch yourself go under, go down, when all you have to do is exercise that power. He was talking about some of them, but the kingdom of God is in us. The Bible tells us, you know, we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. You just got to every morning remember, because I'm a child of God, write this down, I walk in the kingdom of God. I want to tell you something, the kingdom of God is in your bedroom. The kingdom of God is in your kitchen. The kingdom of God is wherever you are. And he says you won't taste death till you see the kingdom of God. Because some of them were going to embrace the promises he had. 
And then, of course, we have that great transfiguration, which leads us into the verses we're talking about, where Jesus actually took his inner circle of Peter, James, and John, and they were all transfigured. It was powerful. Suddenly, there was a transformation where he saw Elisha and Moses show up talking with Jesus. And it was so powerful that, of course, it was Peter said, let's build three tabernacles. You know, Peter wants to stay instead of move on. Can I stop and tell somebody that part of the problem of your dark periods and depressed periods we have as people a propensity to live in the past and to actually glamorize our past. Like I was talking earlier about the good old days. Well, that might have been some good moments in the good old days, but all those good old days weren't good old days. But we glamorize the past. Like I wish I was back there again. And God said the reality is life moves on. We have to go forward instead of backwards. You're never going to get blessed if you live in your past. The past is gone. You have to now make up your mind. God has something better. You know the cliche, the best is yet to come. It's a cliche to the word, but not to us, because that's the kind of God we serve. He promised us Better. I need somebody sitting there right now because my spirit is sensing some agony and some hope. I need you to just say, my best is yet to come. Come on, no, say it like you mean. My best is yet to come. Somebody started laughing because they thought about all the mess going on in their life. But I can tell you and I can declare to you that with Jesus Christ, your best is yet to come. So, we get down to that and we find out that Jesus left there and that's when our verses pick up. Go me to the 14th verse of this ninth chapter. I'm reading from American Standard Version. I want you to savor every word, but there's some hidden power written between the lines. It says, and when they came to the disciples, they saw a great multitude about them and the scribes questioning with them and straightway all the multitude, when they saw him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted, and he asked them, What question ye have with them? What are you questioning them about? And one of the multitude answered him, Teacher, I brought unto them my son, who had a dumb spirit. That meant he was mute, he was deep, he couldn't talk. And wheresoever it taketh him, it dashes him down, and he foamed and grinds his teeth and pineth away. He was having something that was akin to seizures. It just took over his body. And I went to your disciples and that they should cast it out. And they were not able. The King James, which is three of my favorite words, it says they could not. We're going to talk about that. And he answered them and said, Faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him unto me. That's such a terrible indictment by Christ. He's saying, all of you who've been in church, before the pandemic, grew up in church, clapping, singing, know the Christmas songs, know the Easter narratives, know that God is a blessing God, know that God has blessed you, and somehow you get so distracted by the trials of the world that you lose the power that God has given you. He called them a faithless generation. We're going to go through that. And then he said, how long shall I bear? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit, so when he saw him, the spirit tore him grievously. And he fell on the ground and wobbled and foamed. And he asked his father, how long is it since this has come upon him? And he said, from a child. Wow. And oft times it cast him both in the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said unto them, if thou canst, all things are possible to him that believe. Straightway the father of the child cried out and said, I believe! Help that my unbelief. And when he saw that the multitude came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deep spirit, I command you, come out of him, and enter into him no more. And having cried out and tore him much, he came out, and the boy became as one dead, insomuch that the more part 
said, most of the people standing around said, he's dead. But Jesus, wow, took him by the hand, raised him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, how is it that we could not cast it out? And he said unto them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. I'm going to start right there so we can dive into this text. The Bible tells us, when you look at verse 14, I just share with you, Jesus had just come down from Mount Transfiguration, and he had with him his inner circle. And when he got there, he found them questioning. And the first thing he found was that the disciples were asked to cast out the demon, but they could not. Now, follow me. The disciples, stop. The learners of Christ, stop. Those who know Jesus, people only come to you because they think you're different, but nothing will happen if you never act different. Because if you don't act different in your own mind, you won't act different in yourself. So you got to understand, they could not. Now, I want to preface this by giving you three things that these principles are going to take us through. And first, you need to know that this father had tenacity. This father, which we never sometimes focus on this, he had to be someone who cared, as any parent would, about their child. And that's where I get the theme that before you give up, try one more thing. Think about it. He tried the scribes and the Pharisees. He tried the disciples of Jesus. He probably had tried all the Jewish laws and all the remedies that were out there. He tried everything that he could try. And then when he got to the disciples, he thought, surely they could do it. Can you see his hopes dashing? Can you see the scribes and the Pharisees around him laughing? And then all of a sudden, can you see Jesus stop going down? Because his disciples can't produce anything out of their walk. Can I tell you that a lot of times when your spirituality is in question, you bring God's into question because people are waiting to think that God is not real. People are waiting to think that Jesus can't do anything. So the devil shows off and he gets a victory whenever he takes somebody who has already been blessed and act like they don't have any power. I'm talking to somebody out there, you know you have a personal testimony. You know you have a story that will tell how God, how God has blessed you, how many times God has blessed you, how God has guided you, and yet, you let this, this incident that's happening now, I don't know, maybe it wasn't a demonic incident, but there's an incident where you just felt like giving up, throwing in the towel, because the pressure got too much, but I want you to know, before you give up, just like his father did, he had one more try. He could have ran off, but he waited on Jesus. Isn't that something? He waited on Jesus. I like that. He waited on Jesus. Can I encourage somebody, when everything else fails, keep on waiting on Jesus. How many know there's victory if I wait on Jesus? And he will show up. I'm going to give you three reasons why you should wait on Jesus. And they are scriptural, and we'll go into this text. First thing is, Jesus never fails. Deuteronomy 31 and 8. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. This is Moses talking to the children of Israel that it's God who is always going before you. I like the term going before you. We're getting to a place and God has already been there and planted the seeds of our deliverance. All we have to do is make it to that place with a mind that says, when I get there, God has already been there and I'll have what I need. But if we stay in that present moment and don't realize that it was God who led me to that place, and the fact that God was there. If I make it to a place, I need to realize God has already knocked out spirits, so all I got to do is stand up and claim what's mine. You do know that the difference is when you claim what's yours, it's already yours, but you still got to claim it. You know, we had, gone, we had flown one time, and I had left my, my iPad and gone down. Oh, flying is such a pain right now. I don't know when the last time you flew. You've flown, but man, it is a turkey. It is, it is a guesstimate whether or not you'll make it through the airport. It's like, will I arrive or will I won't? But anyway, 
We were there, and I put my iPad in the basket. You know, they had me their code on top of it. You separate your, your laptop from your iPad, and all of a sudden, everything went down so fast. Somebody grabbed my iPad. I grabbed what I thought was the, you know, the tray with my stuff in it. Sat down, put my shoes back on, looked around, said, where's my iPad? We were, we were getting ready to walk through a gate. You know, you had to leave that area to get inside, and all of a sudden, we were coming back home. All of a sudden, I said, I got my iPad. First of all, I had to get back through the other side of the gate. Then when I got there, I had to report. They said, if, if somebody got it, they took it here. I ran around the airport, found that place. Well, it's not there. I ran around the airport. Make a long story short, they took my name and number and said, I can call in a couple days, and if they have it, they'll send it to me. But my iPad did not come back to me. Because the reality of what I'm trying to tell you about understanding the moment that you're in, I was supposed to trust God, you know, I didn't think it through, but I needed to rely on God, and I, I believe that if I would have relied on God in that moment and not panic, I would have had my iPad. That's me. I'm just telling you what I believe. I believe that if I would have just prayed, you know, man, I would have run around that airport, Barely got back in time for me to catch my plane out. And that was just an incident that teaches me that I gotta calm down when something happened. And I gave you a real answer because that was a $900 iPad. And I'm thinking, wow, well, I gotta get this iPad. But I never thought about trusting God. But Jesus never failed. Moses was telling them, God has already been there. Listen to me, brother and sister. Wherever you are now, God has already been there. He brought you there, and He didn't bring you there to be a failure. Hebrews 13 and 5, write it down. He said, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with the things that you have. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. There is some instruction. Let your conversation, the words that come out of your mouth, be without covetousness. Mine, mine, mine. I'm worried. I'm scared. I'm fear. That's what you got to say. Listen to me. I haven't lost you. You know what I'm talking about. You cannot sit there, think godly thoughts, and then come out of your mouth with something that says I'm losing, or I'm not worth it, or I can't make it. You got to make sure that your conversation is filled with the Spirit of God because you realize that Jesus never fails. I told you about my iPad, but think about Lazarus. When Lazarus, I'm going to ask somebody, they can get me a bottle of water, please. <clears throat> and Lazarus, when he was going through his situation, the disciples came to Jesus, and you know, John chapter 11, and you know, the disciples didn't know what was going on, they didn't know what he meant, that you know, that he's dead, and then when he got to Mary and Martha, they said, by now, Lord, he stinketh, <clears throat> and then he was upset, and it's the only place in the Bible, we know this, that Jesus wept, again, why did he weep? Because there was someone he had invested in. Someone he had trusted in. Someone who had seen him do miracles and they thought that he could not raise up a dead situation. <clears throat> Come on, y'all. Y'all help me out here. I'm going to get some water so I can kill this demon of uh, attacking my throat. But what happened is God can raise... You can walk on the screen and see. Thank you. Uh, Vanna White, y'all. <laughs> Thank you. Jesus was upset that they didn't believe he could do it because their conversation had been the otherwise. He can't do it. What have you been speaking? If your conversation is he can't do it, he's not going to be able to do it. But Jesus never fails if your conversation is right. So it says that Jesus, no matter how dead things look, no matter what happens, Jesus said, show me where the body lies. If you ever get in your mind to take Jesus to the point where you gave if you ever get in your mind to take Jesus to the point where you stop, Jesus says, show me where you gave up, and I will raise up whatever is stopping you. And so we know that God never fails. Also, write this down. Jesus never fails. Here's the reason you can trust God. But secondly, write this scripture down. Jesus never changes. <clears throat> That's power. You may change your mind, but Jesus never changes his mind. There's been many times when I changed my mind about myself. We are very finite people. We are very mortal people. We make changes all the time. 
One of my favorite singers said, everything must change. And the Bible tells us nothing stays the same. But the only person, wow, who stays the same is Jesus. If Jesus made a promise to you when you were 12, he'll bring that promise out when you're 120. If Jesus made a promise to you at 10, he'll have that promise at 20. All I'm saying is don't ever give up because Jesus never failed. Jesus never changes. Write the scripture down. Hebrews 13, 8. Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. This is power because it means God is not only omnipresent, omnipresent and omniscient, that God also has the power to never change. He never uh, stops being God. He never loses his power. He is eternal in everything that he does. He never changes. It's one of his attributes to have this infallible ability to never change. That's why I thank God. Sometimes our mortal minds cannot fathom a God who never changes. What am I saying? Because we change so much. We change our minds so quick. Sometimes we can't even change. How many, how many, how many be honest? Sometimes you're going to go somewhere, you change clothes three times before you leave. Have made up your mind the night before what you were going to wear. Then when you got it on, change clothes, change your mind, change clothes, because we change our minds. We change emotionally. We change socially. All of us have this thing in us as we grow, with, uh, and, and some changes are great. You're supposed to change, but I'm talking about changing in the fact that you can't be dependent on. Jesus can be dependent on. Uh, I, have, I remember I had a friend of mine who was a Muslim, and we graduated from high school. He was a Muslim. This is no, this is the honest truth. I saw him. He was practicing. He had all his garb on, which was nothing wrong with that. I respect my Muslim brothers. But when what happened to him? He had been a Christian, then became a Muslim. When I saw him again, he was sitting in the barbershop, getting his hair cut, eating a sausage sandwich. So I had to crack on him. I said, man, what are you doing? He said, man, I, I left the nation. You know, I left the nation. You know, I'm, I'm dealing with the black Jews now. Mixed up. Confused. He didn't know in his mind he was trying to find Jesus. Oh, I just hit somebody's number. That's what's wrong with you. You want a little bit of Jesus, but you don't want all of Jesus, and you're sitting there now changing. Go up and this, go up and that. No wonder you can't have faith. You never put your foot down and said, I'm going to leave this in God's hands. Somebody said, I'm going to hold on to Jesus because Jesus won't change. He made a promise, and I believe that promise is going to bless me. Can I give you one more? I had a young lady who went to high school with me. You got to remember, you talking about during, well, I can't even say that now. It's something how the world comes around. I was going to say when we had a race problem. <laughs> Isn't that funny? We got race problems now, getting worse than it were. But this woman, she was one of my classmates at that time. She was racist. And her and I would sit sometime in the class and she would verbalize why she was racist. Uh-huh. But guess what happened? I was walking through the mall probably... I had been out of school about 10, maybe 15 years, and I saw this woman, a little older, of course, but she was walking with a light-skinned black girl. And I'm thinking, whoa, and she spoke to me. And she looked at, she knew how I was looking at her all the funny, and then she said, James, let me introduce you to my daughter. I said, what? She said, my daughter. I said, your daughter? She's, now, I didn't ask you this. I wasn't that bold. But apparently, there was, she, her husband could not have been a Caucasian, so that means that she had changed her mind. She was now with a black man. All I'm saying to you is we are subject to change because we're not stable, but Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, Jesus never fails. Jesus never changes. We're going to write this down. And the third thing is we look at why his father could stand on his uh, tenacity, could stand on his promise that I'm going to get my child. I don't care what happened. And if any of you are parents, you understand. I never forget when our daughter had an accident and we kept calling and calling. You know, they told us she had an accident. We kept calling and calling and she never answered the phone. When she didn't answer the phone, it just sent us into all kinds of 
you can imagine emotional spasm. We're riding down the road, trusting God. We had to ride from New Jersey to Baltimore. We're riding two hours, and all we could think of, God protect our daughter, protect our daughter. But our thoughts were, with prayers, she was going to be all right. We kept confessing she was going to be all right because we had to believe in the promise of God. And our daughter, the car was told, but she was all right. What am I telling you? You got to trust that God never changed. He hadn't changed his mind when he told us he would protect our children. And the last thing is God is faithful. Write it down. The word faithful is applied to a person who you can safely lean on. Wow. It means something that is faithful is something you can trust. Something that is faithful is something that has the ability inherently within itself to not only sustain itself, but also to sustain you when you trust in him. It's a blessing. And I want you to write this verse down because we have to learn how to hold on. Psalms, uh, let's go to Lamentations uh, 3.23. Lamentations 3.23. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, thy mercies are new every morning. God is a God who is so faithful. Wow. I don't need to stop here. But man, new mercy. How many want some? How many know that's what kept them? He said God is faithful. His mercy is new every morning. I messed up big time last week. I messed up big time yesterday. I messed up big time before I went to bed. But when I got up in the morning, somebody shout new mercy. God said, that's all you need in life. Sometimes to clear your head, to clear your thoughts, and the world can't give that to you. Other philosophies can't give that to you. Nobody else has the power to give that to you. Your money, your things. Only God can say, I'm going to give you new mercy to give you a new outlook as you wake up in the morning. And that mercy helps you straighten out your life. It's manifested in his promises. I love this scripture. Hebrews 10, 23. Let, I'm, I'm reading from an amplified version. Let us hold, Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast, unswervingly, to the hope we profess. For he who promised is faithful. He said, hold, I'm talking about before you give up. Hold on. Because the one who promised is faithful. God is a faithful God. So you just have to hold on to the promise because he is faithful. And then Psalms 33 and 4 says, For the word of the Lord is right and true. Here it is. He is faithful in all he does. God's faithfulness will keep us and bless us. And so that's why we will learn the promises or why this father had to stand because our God, I'm telling somebody something so you can take an exhale right now. You can come up for air. The term come up for air means take a break. Let your breath out. You know, don't get worried anymore. Just exhale and rest in the promise of God. He never fails. He's faithful. And he never changes. So this text is important for us to help us deal with those moments that come in our life when we feel like giving up. We feel like it's so hard to hold on when things are falling apart and breaking down. So I want you to write three things down that we're going to use to go through this, this text and so I can keep you order with me and running with me. First thing you need to understand is you need to know that you need to learn how to strengthen your relationship. Strengthen your relationship. Strengthen. You're going to find out that a lot of this was because you can't just listen to me and, you know, surf you know, through YouTube and Facebook and Instagram and surf through your television, just finding preachers to pour, pour in you, and you don't have a relationship. You need a relationship yourself in God. So the background of this text, it, Jesus was, again, Jesus was at the, what I call the apex of his power. He had done 16, uh, had to be miraculous incidents that had occurred they had the scribes and Pharisees all up in arms because they could not stop Jesus. He had done 16, he demonstrated at least 16 times in the book of Mark through his miracles, through his miracle power, that he was able to do what he needed to do. I'll stop again because right now, I could tell you if I was going to add a 17, I would tell you, look in the mirror. Look in the mirror. 
You're the, if, you need, if you needed a 17th proof, I don't know how jacked up you were. I don't know what you suffered growing up as a child. I don't know the things you had to deal with, divorce or debt, or maybe you were abused. Uh, maybe you got to the point that you don't have a job. Maybe you're homeless. Maybe you got to a point that your child became addicted to drugs. Somebody's in jail. Or your children, when they got old enough, they just went crazy. They weren't looking like anything like you raised. Do you realize you can still pray and trust God? But in order to bridge that gap from your problem to Jesus, you have to, right now, strengthen your relationship with God. This text is important because let me give you a few of the things he had done. Um, he had just showed up to Pharisees with spiritual insight. It's so it's so funny. I don't want to laugh at that, but every time the Pharisees came against Jesus, he had heavenly wisdom. They could do nothing with him. He had a discourse with his disciples about uh, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, how that if you let a little bit of unbelief grow. Just a little bit. It'll continue to grow in your life. Uh, they were, thought he was talking about bread. Finally, Peter revealed that he was the son of God. I told you they had just come from Caesarea Philippi. And Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. And then six days later, he was transfigured. And all of the peasants, the lowliest, everything Jesus does is not done in a corner. You've seen it. So let's pick it up at verse 14. I love this. When they came to the other disciples... They saw a large crowd around him, teachers, uh, and, and the teachers of the law argued with him, Pharisees and scribes. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. When you see that overwhelmed with wonder and came to greet him, I don't care who you are. I don't care how dark it gets. I dare you to go back and find Jesus where you found him. What do I mean by that? I got a special place in my house, every house we've been in. If I travel and go to a hotel room, there may be a chair. In that chair, I've sat down, and that's where I've connected with God and read Scripture so that there will be peace even in my hotel room, like the peace that I have in my house. But every now and then, like even now, when I prepare sermons, there's a certain place that I go. And when I go, it seems like it's already saturated with the Spirit of God. They were overwhelmed because you cannot continue to be overwhelmed by the world if you get to Jesus, because his presence alone will overwhelm you to the point that strength and power will come in your life. His presence alone, I know I have a witness out there that will tell you, if you've ever felt the presence of God, it's not something made up, it's not something you can duplicate, but it's like all of a sudden God can bring a peace in our life that we've never seen before, and it doesn't make a difference what's going on. You can be in a hospital room, I don't care where you are, God can bring a peace in your life that will make you say, God got this. I believe God got this. Somebody say that. God got this. I dare you to put it in the chat. Whatever you're going through, God's got it. He's making a way for you. Can I help somebody? God has already believed in you because he brought you into his family. Now you have to believe in him so you can continue to have the privilege of family. I know it's bad. I know it's hard. I know it's lonely. I know it gets dark. I'm talking about those moments when you feel like giving up. I want you to talk about and face the real stuff that happens. I know. But the reality is Jesus Christ will put wonder and he will overwhelm you to the point that you wonder how you made it. And Jesus said to them in verse 16, let's go through the verse, said, uh, what are you arguing with him about? A man in the crowd said, teacher, his father. I brought my son to your disciples. He's possessed by a spirit. Wow. And it says, uh, and it robs him of his speech. And then it seizes him and throws him down. He gashes, gnashes, or gashes in the mouth and foams at the mouth. And it just gnashes and throws him around. What is it saying? It's emulating a seizure. The demon came in and just had his way. Now you need to know we are talking about being possessed by the mind of the spirit. Somebody says, Shh, that ain't us. We can't be, we can't be possessed. Yeah, uh, kind of true. But here's the worst part. You can be harassed, oppressed, run all over the place, and he will build a stronghold in your mind that's just as bad as possession. 
No, he can't forcefully take over believers. But he can put so many, he can build so many strongholds or positions that he owns in your thinking so you're walking around as if you were possessed. Can't smile, don't have any peace, don't have any joy. I'm talking to somebody. No, you're not a person. You're not a possessed of a devil. No, but because the spirit of God is in you. But you have to remember, I can be oppressed and harassed and ran all over the place. And I can be beat up by demons. They can just drive me into wanting to stay in my house. And they can drive me to a point where I can't trust God. How do I know? Because Ephesians 6 and 12. Write it down. For we wrestle. I don't know about you, but the text did not say for we box. Boxing is when you stand at a distance, you know, and you throw some punches. But wrestling means you got to have some hands-on experiences. He didn't get in you, but he sure jumped on your mind, jumped inside of your mind, and all of a sudden you believed his thoughts. And when those thoughts built a stronghold, you were resting. What am I resting for? I'm resting to try to get back to Sammy. You've had one of those days where you were saying, I don't know what's wrong, but something's wrong. I don't, I don't, you don't feel right. It, it's not. It's, it's almost as bad as a physical nausea, but it's a spiritual nausea where you're sitting there wondering something's not right, and you try to read. Or, that's that. That's that enemy. That's that spirit trying to stop you from walking in what you're walking. Look what it says: For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers. Uh, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Look at all of those types of demons that we wrestle with. So, we cannot be possessed, but we wrestle, and in the wrestling, if the demon wins, you lose your power. Hmm. Uh, there's a whole lot of demonic spirits out there that we wrestle with, but so you can be on the same page, can I give you some spirits that we have to wrestle with that harass us, that mess us up, and if we don't trust God, they can destroy our life. Somebody say, yeah. All right, come on, let me give you The first one is a lying spirit. It's a spirit. Look at 1 John 4 and 6. We are of God. 1 John 4 and 6. We are of God. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error or the spirit of a lie. Oh, I just said a lie, I got to unpack it. He said, when I get saved, I can discern that it's a spirit of error. It's in error because it goes against the truth in God's word. An error is always something that's not the truth. It's not true. And so, when you live your life in with a spirit, a, a lying spirit controlling you, then you get to the point where you start walking in the error instead of walking in the truth. There's some folk, you know it, who lie just to be lying, and lying comes easy to this fallen nature. Amen, Pastor. Lying comes easy. How many know you got? How many know you told a lie before you know it? Uh-oh. I ain't listening to Pastor Thunder no more. He just raised his name because he told a lie. I got to correct. I got to wrestle. I got to catch myself. I got to make sure I don't lie. Especially when I'm speaking, the Bible says in a multitude of words, there is no error. Meaning, I talk all the time. I got to make sure. I check myself. Don't make something up. Don't just say anything. I, I program my mind that when I do that, all of a sudden there's something that rings in my conscience that says, that's not right. That's why you may hear me. Oh, I, I got to correct the I gotta correct the scripture. Because it's, but if you walk in error long enough, you're giving it that. Trying to trust God's word, but you have your mind set on the lie. And lies are so powerful. Oh, these spirits are so powerful, they'll make you believe it. You'll lie so much till you believe the lie you told. But a lying spirit. In John 8, 44, remember, Jesus told them there, you're of your father, the devil, he was a liar from the beginning, John 8, 44. That lying spirit will make you unable to walk in the power of the truth because you lie so much. I know you didn't want to turn into this Bible study, but I'm trying to help you. A second one is, here's another one that messes us up where we don't have power. I know you know this already. Cry! Oh my God! Thinking that you're all that. So then when you get hurt, you're hurt more than you used to be hurt because you thought you were all that. And when you think you're all that, all of a sudden you're way down in the dumps when you find out you're not. 
Then you bring in the lion spirit, try to lift you up so you can watch this. And those spirits start getting stronger. Watch the text. Proverbs 16, 18, 19. Check this out. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be humble in spirit with lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Pride is one of the worst demons because it robs God of his glory. How do I know? Because pride is the sin that Lucifer, who used to be the star of the morning of God in heaven, was cast down because his pride got so much that he decided, I'm going to lift myself up above God. And please understand, we talk about, oh, the devil. Oh, Satan must have been crazy. As soon as you get prideful enough that you take God's glory, or you don't give glory to God where it's due, you are also doing the same thing that the devil did. You are actually at a place where you wonder why I'm helpless, because God can't give you glory when you already stole his glory. And now you're walking around in pride. Watch this. And pride is such a killing spirit because it, it boasts of stuff it can't do. Take your mask off. Only person concerned about how good you look and how good you can do that is you. Pride tells you, don't ever let your mask on. Ever. No. Pride sends you to a place that you can't keep yourself. Because pride is saying that I'm God enough to do better than God when it comes to running my life. And that's, that's, that's a lying spirit. That's another spirit. Here's another one. You know this one already. Fear. Somebody asked me that question. I said, Pastor, I've been saved a long time. Why do I still have to fight with fear? Because the Bible tells us very succinctly, 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. For all those folk out there who tell you there's no such thing as demonic spirits, spirits that are wrestling with you and trying to, and trying to take you down, show them this scripture. If they have any kind of understanding of theology, they will tell you that this was something straight from the mouth of God. God did not give us the spirit of fear, but the fact that he said he didn't give it to us means there is a spirit out there called fear. And how many will tell you it will attack you? Man, I get attacked by fear constantly. See, most, most Christians don't want to say that. They walk around, you know, I'm strong. No, I confess I'm strong so I can knock down and beat fear. And what keeps me strong is when I say God is not giving me the spirit of fear. And then I shake it off. How you got to shake it off? And that's why it's so important that you watch the words of the text. It says, God gave me power. That means the Holy Ghost in me can help me fight the fear. Did you catch that? He said, you got the power. Yes, the fear will come. Yes, the fear is real. And fear is one of those catch-22s. Fear is good until it gets in the hand of the devil. You should be fearful driving 89 and 90 miles down the turnpike. You should be fearful not to take your high blood pressure medicine. You don't know what's going to happen to you. Could be a stroke. You should be fearful when your children are gone and you haven't heard from them and they said they're going to call. Fear is something that alarms you. But you shouldn't be fearful over everyday life in everyday situations, and that fear should have a control. When you know it's a demon and not just natural fear, it's when that fear just continues to rob you of thinking, rob you of peace, rob you of a time when you can sit down and enjoy your life. It says, but God gave us power, he gave us love. Oh, God loves me. That should move that fear out of your life. And then he said, I gave you a sound mind. I love that. All of these words are so we can understand how we fight the battle. He said, I gave you a sound mind. That means in my mind, when the devil brings a lie, I know the truth. Somebody go with me. I know the truth. I know the truth. Don't tell me you've never been fearful. I don't care how many years you've been saved. I don't care how many times you listen to the word. I don't care how many titles in your name. I don't care, I don't care if you're bishop, apostle. I don't care who you are. All of us gets attacked by the spirit of fear. We better learn how to put it down. And here's another one. We don't... Another spirit that attacks us is called the spirit of infirmity. 
Now, I'm walking in, in what they call high cotton now, so i got to make sure I explain this to you. Don't believe the lie that we never get sick. Not true. And I, I shouldn't have to say this because you've been sick. I told you one of my, my, my you know, I, I had one time fallen in line with all prosperity type preaching. I, I, you know, I thought it takes something away from God if you couldn't say God do all this. But then I, I wasn't real about the human experience. I'm not talking about the fallen human experience. I'm talking about the fact of the limitations in this human body. Everything that we feel day and night. And so we trust in all of our physical attributes. We know we need to drink water. You know, we know we need to eat something. We know we need exercise. We need rest. How come you can't see that there's a spiritual world out there also? And in that spiritual world, things, the devil always takes what God makes good and try to turn it around. So our human body is going to get sick. So what the devil does, he comes in and brings a spirit of infirmity, which means it leads us more quickly to sickness because of our mindset. Oh, i got to break this down. i got to explain it to you. This is the text first. This is the scripture. Luke 13 and 11. And behold, there was a woman who had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bent over and in no way could raise herself up. The spirit of infirmity that attacked her was one that maybe she had some natural sickness and then the spirit wrote it and kept her in bondage to that. Because you know when Jesus delivered her from the spirit, you know, this, uh, we, we all know the scripture no matter who you are. Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Now watch this. He didn't say, I cast sickness out or I open your blind eyes like he did for sick people. He said it was a spirit on this woman. And we know that our minds, our bodies, our thought life can keep us sick if we don't cast that spirit out. Every time you turn around, something wrong with you. Every little ache, the devil tries to come in there with that spirit and he just sensationalizes it. Oh, I must be dying. Oh, and pretty soon you walk around as this sick person, spiritually sick from this spirit that jumped on you and you didn't have enough strength in your spirit. To get it out of you. And if you look at it, it tells you that Jesus delivered her by saying, Woman, you are loosed. That's deliverance. That means he broke a chain. He, he set her free from that negative type thinking. Can I give you one more spirit? Another one. These are all that. I, it's something. When I give you these, it's because these are the ones we read about, we can believe, and you understand every day the devil's trying to jump on you with these spirits. And the last one is, we don't have the spirit of bondage. Once I got saved, every other bondage that I have to fight my way through, I fight my way through it because I no longer have a spirit that says I need to stay in bondage. If I fail once, I don't have a spirit that say, oh, we can't do that. We're going to fall again. No, that's bondage. When Jesus says, um, he that the sun sets free is free indeed. It means that no matter how many times you get tied up, you break forth, you break free of those chains. But what we do when the spirit of bondage comes, the bondage itself is what scares us. Ooh, that was good. The bondage scares me. I'm scared of being in bondage. I'm, I'm scared. Somebody said I got cancer. Ooh. Not only are you counting that they have all these technological ways, but what happened to your trust in God? It's not the end in itself. What we do is, as soon as we hear about the bondage, we just get so fearful. Somebody's looking at me tonight is thinking about a bondage. Something that happened to you, you don't let yourself be taken in bondage by something when you know that God has said you're already free. Let's read the text. Romans 8.15 For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, or my Father. Demonic spirits, if you're not careful, they can make you compulsive, obsessive. They can make you, the, the Holy Ghost living in you, Jesus all around you, and they'll make you more fearful than when you were not saved. Because you didn't understand 
that we have to wrestle through these spirits. I say that because the first thing the Father did was he realized, I didn't get to Jesus. And he wrestled through, no matter how many times he was told no, because he realized something that's shown up in the next part of his text. And that is, we have, every one of us, a special relationship with God. Amen. We're going to close right there. Because we're going to pick up this text next week. Remember we talked about before you give up. I just told you reasons why not to give up. I told you some things that's happening that's trying to make you give up. Now we're going to look at how to get through this. First of all, i got to realize I have a special relationship. Man, you special. Woman, you special. Don't, don't even cheat yourself acting like somebody else. You got a special relationship with God. Please, go to our uh, SBC Grace Church, which is our hashtag for our Facebook and our uh, YouTube. Go there. Uh, I want you to go to our channel and hit the notification bell on Facebook and, and make sure that you share this message with somebody. But on YouTube, I want you to go there and I want you to actually become a part of our channel, our YouTube channel. Make sure you tell yourself, I want to make sure that I register to be a part of Shiloh Baptist Union. Ring that bell. You know, hit that bell and register. So you can be a part and say, look, my, when you get our subscription, you get all of the other stuff that comes with that subscription. So subscribe today. Check out our Instagram. And when you go to Instagram, you'll get little snippets of our worry every day. And don't forget, every morning, the ministers here at Shiloh, a powerful group of ministers, they are giving you five minutes of deliverance every Sunday morning. And if you want to become a member of Shiloh, go to our website, uh, www.shilohbaptistchurches, www. That's it. And there you can register. And also, hit that give button. Cash app. You say, Pastor, I love this Bible study night. I just want to give a something to the ministry. Cash app is dollar sign Shiloh J-A-D. Dollar sign Shiloh J-A-D. And then you can also use Giveify or PayPal. But look, just know that this ministry is moving. And please come back next week and get the second part of this message before you give